Good morning, everyone. Are you enjoying the conference so far? Yeah, good. Well, I'm excited to be back here this year. I wasn't sure I was going to be able to make it, and so that I'm happy that I'm here. Um, the original intent for this session was for Dan and I to make an announcement about some new projects, some joint projects, a joint project that we are working on, uh, rather than as a workshop. So we're going to kick off with a description of some very exciting news. And then uh, after that, I'll elaborate and expand on it a little bit. And uh, then we can have an open Q&A and talk about whatever it is that you like to talk about, as we did last year and have done several times before. What I'm really, what I'm really passionate about in this space of regenerative agriculture is having regenerative agriculture models become the standard, become the status quo, the mainstream globally around the world by 2040. That's why I founded Advancing Eco Agriculture, why I'm doing the work that I'm doing, why we started the podcast to freely and readily share information, make it available to everyone. And one of the pieces that has become abundantly clear is that in order to understand regenerative agriculture agronomy well, there are so many different areas of science that we need to understand. Growers need to know a little bit about horticulture. They need to know a little bit about the genetics, or I shouldn't say a little bit, but actually a lot. They need to know a lot about genetics, a lot about horticulture, a lot about biochemistry, biophysics, plant pathology, entomology. There are so many integrated areas of science that all come together in understanding agriculture and plant production. And this is a significant challenge. This is a challenge for growers, and it's also a challenge for us as a company. When we hire someone to join our team, our agronomy team and our consulting team, we have a challenge. We have set such an extremely high bar and a high standard of, of leadership. And our team is expected to be extremely knowledgeable about all these different areas and be able to implement them in any given situation, any operation. So when we hire someone to join our team, one of our significant limiting factors to growth as a company is our ability to train people and get them to understand all these different areas. We have had PhDs go through our training course. We have a very intense training course. And they have said that uh, they learned more in the first 90 days of our training course than they did in their entire degree. That's a very common feedback that we get. So I believe it's very important to democratize information and to digitize information, make it widely and readily available. But the learning, there is such a large volume and quantity of information that is valuable and needs to be learned. And it takes time to process all of that and to assimilate all of that. One of the questions that I've been thinking about a lot is how can we restrict that? How can we remove that barrier to adoption and to growth, both for our team as a company and also for growers around the world? So our over the last four years, I have been thinking quite deeply about a project of digitizing all of our knowledge and putting together algorithms that take all this information and report results and make agronomic recommendations in exactly the same way that we do as consultants. So this is obviously a significant challenge because there are so many interrelated areas. And um, I'm quite... I'm quite excited. Over the last few months, we have begun actively working on this project. Um, as of for this moment, we're calling it the AI Agronomist. Our goal is by the end of next year, this time next year, to have a beta launched where people will be able to upload all of their soil analysis data, plant sap analysis, irrigation water, varieties, um, be able to put in all their agronomic data that they have. And we will, be, we, have, we will have very specific um, requests for information that is needed to make the information complete. And the, then the AI agronomist will give you specific recommendations for what types of soil amendments you might need, for what types of microbial inoculants you might benefit from, for what types of foliar applications you might benefit from, what types of varieties might do well in your situation. So there will be a tremendous amount of information flowing into the back end. Um, we will be collecting uh, meteorological data, lunar cycle data, 
um, soil information. So there's, there's a lot of information that is publicly available. And there is also a lot of laboratory work that may need to be done on some farms to prepare us and get to this point. But what I'm really excited about is that when we make this available, all of a sudden, someone who becomes interested in regenerative agriculture and wants to grow food in this way, for the first time, they can, they can learn about it in December. And in February, they can have some guidance on what they are going to do on their farm. It really, it can supersede the learning process. Obviously, the learning still needs to happen. The education still needs to happen. But this can help take all of this knowledge that is represented by so many scientists in the field and put it into a usable, practical form that anyone can access. And what I'm really excited about is that that is then not just available for growers here in North America, where AEA is working a lot, but also for growers in South America and in Africa and in Europe and in Asia and around the world. So this, I believe, will be a foundational piece to making regenerative agriculture become the mainstream. Here's why I'm so excited, one of the reasons why I'm so excited about it. The conversation today, many, what really drives many growers' decision-making process, and it's a very human tendency, is rather than planning of how to prevent problems, we react to problems. And so many growers are looking for solutions to a specific insect pest or a specific disease. So all of the information exists today to be able to identify the underlying nutritional issues that result in a specific insect pest being in a crop. Let's say that we have a potato farmer in Colorado who has 11 fields of potatoes. It's possible for that potato grower to get an alert that says, you need to begin scouting your potato fields for Colorado potato beetle because they're expected to emerge from winter dormancy in the next 24 to 48 hours. And of your 11 fields, field number three and field number eight are very highly susceptible to infection. Field number three is susceptible because it has high levels of nitrates, and it has high levels of nitrates because you have low levels of molybdenum, and you need to apply 50 grams of molybdenum per acre to remove your susceptibility from a nine down to a two. Field number eight is very susceptible because it has low levels of magnesium. You need to apply five pounds per acre of magnesium sulfate to move your susceptibility down to a two. That completely changes the conversation. The conversation is now no longer about you need to apply this insecticide. It's about this is why you have the problem, and this is what you can do to reverse it. All the information already exists to put that platform together, but nobody has done it yet, and we intend to do it. We're going to have fun. <laughs> Thank you, John. <clears throat> so uh, those of you who know, know us know we've been conspiring for more than a decade together. And this has been one of our fantasy projects uh, for many years. And so to be able to be publicly announcing the fact that we're working on this together and you know, there's a real time frame in which this is going to occur, I think is I'm just really honored and yeah, exhilarated to be here. I think the agreement we made about 10 years ago was that John would go the for-profit route <laughs> and I'd go the non-profit route and we'd, we'd coordinate behind the scenes. Um, and so that's pretty much what's been happening. And we give each other a hard time about various things at various points in time. But yeah, to, to build this framework out, which we've you know, established to a large degree with the open team, with the, you know, the, all the data partners we're working on with the Real Food Campaign, collaborative framework with companies and universities and organizations and farmers, open source to look at the in-field dynamics and then to be able to build the hardware that can do the sensing. I think that's the one piece John didn't talk about was uh, the ability to do in-field assessment with the spectrometer. Anybody who's been working with him do the plant sap analysis and harvesting the leaves and sending them off to Europe and spending hundreds of dollars a week and getting reports back two weeks later. I think that's one of, been one of John's really systemic frustrations over the past couple of years is how can we get this real-time infield data back sooner? And you know the answer is if we can assess what's going on in the plant in real time with something like a spectrometer, then we have the ability to actually take that, you know, whatever that investment is that you'd be spending on sampling leaves and sending them to the to um, Holland or Netherlands, um, to be able to basically 
take two weeks of investment in, in plants, leaf samples, and have a piece of hardware that you can use forever thereafter. So it is a big, complicated, hairy, audacious project. Um, <laughs> and we've been working on it for a while. And it's going to require resources. But uh, yeah, to be able to formally announce this and really move forward actively in pulling it off is, is very exhilarating. So this is John's stage. I just wanted to be here, or he asked me to be here to <laughs> confirm it as well. So thank you all for being here. And I'm sure you're going to have a wonderful next hour and 20 minutes. Thank you. So I think one of the important pieces that Dan and I have agreed to collaborate on and our collective enterprises with Advancing Eco-Agriculture and the Bionutrient Food Association, one of the strengths that we have is that we have a lot of historical data on a large scale. For uh, right At this moment in time, we have, I don't know the exact count, but we have several hundred thousand um, data points, closer to a million than to the bottom end of the scale. On, that represent 48 different crops across the country, 40 crops. Those are 40 crops that we have a significant amount of data on. And what we have learned uh, in, from experience is that many growers may have the best of intentions, but they uh, often lack the bandwidth and the resources to be able to collect samples in a timely manner during the growing season. And so in our work at AEA, in any area where we have a local concentration of growers, we're working with a large number of growers, we actually have our team our staff is out in the field collecting all the data. They're doing all the sample collection. And so our collaboration over the course as the spectrometer is developed, um, we will be working closely with the spectrometer to develop all the data libraries and to match what is happening, what the, what the, what the spectrometer readouts are with our historical SAP analysis. And based on simply on the volume of data that we go through in a single growing season or in as little as uh, a few months, we expect to be able to have a very strong data library to be able to use the spectrometer in the field to make management decisions very rapidly, very quickly. So, very good. And Dan is correct. We have been dreaming about this for a decade. So, in fact, I first, I first wrote the, I wrote the first set of algorithms and the, and, the, and the first outline for what we're now calling the AI agronomist in 2014. And I got done with this spreadsheet that was an absolute monstrosity. And when I got done, my last sentence at the bottom said, we have everything that we need to make this work in real time, except we don't have a sensor that can analyze nutritional profiles in the field. So that's what we've been waiting for. And certainly we can do it, and we will be doing a lot of this with laboratory analysis, um, even to, to help develop the spectrometer. But the eventual expectation is that if the spectrometer does what we believe it's going to be capable of doing, we'll have an infield tool. Imagine having an infield tool that could do a soil analysis, that could do an irrigation water analysis, that could do a leaf sap analysis, could do all of those things and more. So that's. That's the dream and the aspiration that we're working toward. So it's all good. <laughs> all right. So um, Dan asked me to also speak a little bit about the, some of the information that is going into the AI agronomist and some of the pieces that are behind it. And it's really big. And it's almost more than I can describe very quickly and easily. But there are a few pieces uh, that I will describe that might be unexpected. I'll focus on some of the unexpected pieces, the unanticipated pieces. One of those is um, we, we're still reviewing data to make all the correlations and connections. But it seems that there is a connection between overall plant health and performance and cosmic radiation as measured uh, on the KP index and uh, the phi angle. So you can, there are a number of resources. One that uh, I enjoy uh, paying attention to is a website called Space Weather News. And essentially, it gives us, when we look at sunspot activity and solar activity, Sunspot activity correlates to 
Well, first of all, the, the photons coming from the sun can have either a negative or a positive charge. They're not all the same. And the charges that reach the Earth's surface depend on a number of different factors, including the radiation shielding, magnetic shields, the Van Allen belts, etc. And there is a counterpoint between solar radiation and cosmic radiation. And what that means is that when we have periods of stronger solar radiation, we have that actually strengthens the magnetic field protect, envelope protecting the Earth. And that effectively shields cosmic radiation coming in. Or you can have the opposite effect, where you have very weak solar radiation and you have much stronger cosmic radiation coming in. Why is this important and why should it matter? Well, there's two reasons. One is that solar, the, the charges on the solar radiation actually influence plant health very strongly. We've started observing a few years ago, once as we really dialed into plant health more and more, we started observing that uh, there could be periods of a few days, or in some cases even a few weeks, where solar radiation seemed to actually impact plants negatively rather than positive, positively. And of course, that's the opposite of what you would expect to be happening. That's when we first started looking at the qualities of solar radiation and how it varies. And then, of course, for those of us thinking about um, biodynamic agriculture and when we plant seeds in alignment with various solar cycles and lunar cycles as, uh, as uh, according to the various constellations, all of a sudden it we realize that the influence of cosmic radiation is also mediated by solar radiation. So when you have very weak solar radiation, which allows a lot of cosmic radiation to come through, which is actually has happened a lot this last year, then the influences of when you plant a seed in correlation to different the presence of different uh, being in the presence of different constellations has a much bigger impact. Uh, and this is another topic that is a bit out in left field for some people, but I think it's a very important one. What we have observed is that the timing at which you plant seeds according to uh, in association with a given constellation has less of an impact. In fact, it, I can say that it has almost no impact on very challenged soils. Soils that have very low organic matter, soils that have very low microbial activity, you don't see much of a difference if you separate planting by a few dates, by a few days. But when you have high organic matter soils and you have really active microbial activity, that difference becomes, can become extremely pronounced. So the healthier your farms are, the healthier your soils are, the bigger of a difference you can make by selecting the dates at which you plant your seeds. Um, so, that was some far out of left field information. <laughs> um, what else is important? Obviously, we're including all of the information on uh, soil analysis, plant leaf analysis. Um, We expect it will take some time. We don't yet have enough data. It will take some time for us to develop the data on understanding uh, which varieties correlate to given nutritional profiles and given environments. But I expect there, there, we will, without, let me back up just a moment. When we first started using plant sap analysis in 2011, plant sap analysis really revolutionized our understanding of the interaction of minerals inside plants and how to best supply those minerals within plants because for the first time we had an accurate, an accurate window into what was actually happening, what was actually going on. We no longer had to guess. And as a result of plant sap analysis displacing tissue analysis on, uh, on all, almost all the operations, all the operations that we work with, we, there were some things that we expected to find, and we learned a lot more that we didn't expect, that we didn't know, that we had no idea was coming. I expect the same will happen once we begin collecting all this additional information, looking at all the correlations, and on a digital platform, we will be able to make correlations between specific nutritional profiles, specific varieties, that we can't anticipate and don't expect right now. What 
we have observed already with the plant sap analysis is that the genetics the, of a given variety of a crop has a tremendous influence on absorption of nutrients from the soil. We know that we can have uh, two different varieties. Dan, and with his work here at the BFA, has described how you can have the same variety of carrots and have radically different nutritional profiles from different soils. But the other additional element is that if you then take those, that one variety and you put it onto the optimal soil, the soil where it really thrives the best, you can plant another variety right beside it that might now have three times a higher nutritional profile than the original variety. So there are also varietal differences. And then to add another layer, the nutritional, the, these various varieties will perform differently on different soils. So on one soil or in one environment where the original variety tested might not do well and might not have a good nutritional profile, there is another variety that might have a 5x higher nutritional profile on that soil. So there are both varietal differences and soil differences that we expect to be able to correlate once we have more of the information, more of the data to be able to do that. So I'd like to open it for questions. Do you have any questions on what we're working on and, uh, or suggestions on what you would like to see? When are we releasing the AEA planting calendar? Uh, don't know. I haven't thought about that. We actually did release a couple of years ago um, the AEA foliar spraying calendar. And that one is still in existence and floating around somewhere. It's been a while since I spoke about that. But we observed a very distinct 28-day cycle with plant absorption of nutrients. Uh, the original observation occurred with the Dutch team in the Netherlands that developed sap analysis. They observed when they were working with hydroponic growers, they would uh, measure not only the, the sap analysis, but also the quantity of nutrients that came through their hydroponic system. So how many nutrients were left in the water at the end of each week? And they discovered a very distinct cycle where um, one week out of the four, and I can't remember which, um, which is which right now. I'd have to reference the calendar. But out of the total four-week cycle, one week out of the four, plants absorb 75% of all the nutrients in the water. Two weeks out of four, 50%, and they... One week out of four, which was two weeks out of phase with the 75%, they only did 25%. So radically different absorption of nutrients from the soil based on the lunar cycle. So we've actually been able to correspond to that and try to better time when we put on foliar applications and when we put on irrigation applications. Uh, for some crops, if we're growing high value of fruit and vegetable crops, it, it really doesn't matter because we're going to be doing it constantly all the time. But for crops where we're only putting on three to five applications per season, Timing those applications to match up with the lunar cycles gives us a tremendous crop response and a much greater efficiency for the products that we're actually applying. So, and, and again, this, what I get excited about is that I can be here having this conversation with you talking about lunar cycles and we have the PDF published somewhere on the Advancing Eco-Agriculture website. But now we will be able to take that information and put it into a recommendations engine to say, you need to put on your soil amendment applications, you need to put on your uh, biological applications this week. Don't put them on in two weeks from now, put them on this week, and you'll get a much bigger soil health response, a much bigger crop response. And all of a sudden, that information that can be shared verbally and trained and needs to be, also becomes immediately executable and implementable by everyone around the world. That's what I'm excited about. Yeah. Yes. I'm also very excited uh, by this uh, introduction we got by producers flowing. I'm an academic, so all this data you're assembling and analyzing is really very exciting. But as you talked, I had some two apprehensions. Uh, the first is that of a social scientist, which is that this is still operating very much within the conventional paradigm of agriculture which we look for deficiencies, and we remedy them with our inputs. We're throwing this. And the, the measurements you have, the second concern right here, are essentially chemical. There's, while we use biology as a remedy, you don't analyze the bio, soil biology as a cause of some of these things. That's very hard to do, I, I can see. But I, 
see it in some ways as reinforcing the present model where farmers are not investigators, diagnosticians, analysts, problem solvers. At the worst, it becomes sort of automatons. You have this really comprehensive recommendation system. Mm -hmm. As the farmers do what they're told, they, they, they don't need to be flesh and blood. And I'm, I'm taking this very extreme, but that's an apprehension that not building into this more the soil systems, mm -hmm. the, the microbial dynamics, the biodiversity, and so forth, the part of this, which might get reflected sometimes in your chemical measurements, but are those are only symptoms, not causes. And this doesn't really get as fundamentally at the biological dimension as, as I would be inclined to have a good answer for that. Yeah. I want to share that. Yes. So thank you for that comment. I have, you, you've raised a couple of different points. So to the first of, of uh, influencing and managing biology rather than purely taking a chemistry approach, the, I, I've framed or uh, spoken about primarily the chemistry piece because of the implications, of course, of the spectrometer that Dan is developing. However, the, the information that we're collecting, um, we are also measuring a number of different soil parameters, including infiltration rates, and we're you're correct on those microbial assays. Those are a challenge because we, we need a microbial assay that is both quantitative and qualitative at the same time. It's, we, it's not enough to just identify the presence of an organism. We also need to know the quantity of a given organism present. And as of yet, there isn't technology capable of doing that. But there, there is qualitative information on um, when we look at soil aggregation, we can do some analog metrics. And we are using those analog metrics, and we are also making recommendations for compost applications, for what types of cover crops for use, for what type of tillage to use or not to use. And our entire, the way we're framing the entire conversation in the engine that we're developing is to shift the thinking to in two ways. One is to think about the cause of the problem rather than just the symptom. And the second is to think about the, or to have the recommendations emphasize the biological solution, not the chemistry solution. So I failed to mention that. That is important. Um, then to your point on the sociological implications, every time a recommendation is made, this will take some time to develop, of course, because there's so many explanations. But every time a, a recommendation is made, we want anyone to be able to challenge that. Why is this recommendation being made? And immediately for us to provide a reference and a link that they can look and say, OK, this is why we made the recommendation this way, to give people the capacity to see that, learn that, and also to disagree with it and to give us feedback. And then to your uh, extreme example of our idea of farmers becoming automatons. Um, is what many farmers do today so very different from that? Yeah. <laughs> but I think this, you raise an important question. It's certainly something that we have thought about and that we need to think more about. The, the desire is to completely change the relationship with the crop that they're growing, because I very strongly believe that um, one of the significant failures that we have in our agriculture today is that our agriculture has no soul. It has no heart. There is no longer a heart connection with the plants that we're producing. It's become very mechanistic, very intellectual, and that in order for us, we know that if we want to produce food that has the capacity to produce um, I'll use the words spiritual coherence. Food needs, to, plants need to be grown with love. They need to grow, be grown with heart. They respond to that. And there's a lot of information behind this. Again, this might be coming out really out of left field for some people. If you want to dig more deeply into this, I very highly recommend um, Stephen Herod Buner's series of three books. Um, the first is titled The Lost Language of Plants. The second is The Secret Teachings of Plants. And the third is plant intelligence. Yes. The first book is The Lost Language of Plants. 
The second is the secret teachings of plants. And the third is plant intelligence. Stephen Buhner is perhaps my favorite author for his writing style. I purchased every book that he ever wrote, even the ones not related to agriculture, because so much enjoyed reading his writing. But those three books are perhaps my three personal favorites. They are absolutely incredible. And I'll just give you one hint. I, I've gifted these books to many different people. And many people, particularly the lost language of plants, when they start reading it, they can't put it down. I, I've had people read for 26 hours straight to finish the book. Uh, more than one person, uh, more than a handful. And to give you just a glimpse of some of the pieces that Stephen speaks about, I can't possibly begin to do justice to all the topics that he covers. He, he describes the science of plant-human communication, but he also, and he describes the science of plant-to-human heart communication. It's not just an intelligent process, or an intellectual process. And in the, um, in the last of the three books, Plant Intelligence, he describes plant neural networks. And this one, I read a lot. I'm not often surprised. I was surprised and delighted by the book of Plant Intelligence. He describes how we historically have thought of human intelligence in the context of the brain, the brain being a specific organ with a number of neurons, large number of neurons. And as our thinking has evolved, we've realized that it's not just the brain, but there's actually a tremendous number of neurons in our digestive system, in our gut. There's a lot of neurons around our heart. And that we need to think of intelligence not in terms of brain capacity, intellectual capacity, but in terms of neural networks. And so when we begin thinking about neural networks, this is from, from our neural network in, in our body, that's why uh, we can actually have a conversation about heart cognition, uh, recognizing what's happening with our hearts, and also why we many times may use the words, I have a gut feeling about something, because we do have a gut feeling about something. What really rocked me was the realization that plants have the exact same neural networks as we do. And not, when I say the exact same neural networks, not only uh, the, the, their neural network is all the growing root tips. All the growing root tips are all connected. And the, the neurotransmitters that plants use are have many similarities to the neurotransmitters that humans use as well. In fact, the single dominant neurotransmitter in both plants and humans is serotonin. Plant neurotransmission is based on serotonin and serotonin-derived compounds and molecules. So when we start thinking about plant intelligence, many annual species have smaller root systems and they don't have a neural network that is perhaps as large as ours. But when you start talking about perennial species, particular trees, when you have a large mature tree, the neural network of a tree is significantly larger than the neural network of most people. So now, which, who really carries the most wisdom? So I would really encourage everyone to dive into that a bit more deeply, yes. There is, the reality is what, what has brought me to this project and the reason I started hosting the Regenerative Agriculture podcast was learning that there is so much valuable information out there as, as Elaine's work and um, I, I could give a long list of scientists' work who have done incredible research that is not generally applied in production agriculture. And uh, an example of this is occasionally um, I, I've had the desire for some time to put together a resource that, um, on a collection 
of all the peer-reviewed published papers that correlate the presence of a specific insect or disease in a crop, uh, particularly insects, with a given nutritional profile. And I started this project a few weeks ago. And when I started, I thought, oh, there's probably a couple hundred papers out there. And well, I'm two weeks in. And the project is uh, going to have to be, some, at some point, I'm going to have to define boundaries and limits because it just keeps spreading and spreading. And there's thousands of papers, not hundreds. My point being simply that there is a tremendous amount of information that isn't widely practiced. And the intent for the podcast was to be able to make that easily accessible to growers and producers. And then the next step, of course, is how do we clearly and simply describe in which situations they can apply it and how they can apply it. So I don't know. Did I give a reasonable answer to your comment? That was my best shot. <laughs> yes. Good question that I haven't thought about. So the question, the question was, uh, AEA has expressed the, uh, has, uh, the expressed intent of developing nutritional and microbial products that are so effective that they eventually displace the needs to be used, that the soil health and plant health develops to such a point that you don't need to use the products anymore. And we have quite a number of farms who have reached that goal now, and that's personally quite exciting, um, to me at least. So the, 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 question, the question was, at what point does the AI agronomist become redundant and no longer necessary? And so I would say there's, there are two points uh, that come to mind. And I have not thought about that question. That's a really great question. And I am going to spend a lot of time thinking about it. But <laughs> I would say part one is that when you, again, when the overall ecosystem reach such a general, uh, reaches a state of such vibrant health, that it is self-sustaining, then you don't need to be constantly doing the monitoring and measuring. And the second thought that comes to mind is I, I see this also, uh, and I desire it to be a tool for education about specific problems. Because so many times when I teach uh, webinars and I teach at conferences, questions, I, and I, I teach a lot about general principles and concepts. And questions are often very specific. What do I do about x? And I want the AI agronomist to be complete enough that a grower can be able to ask the question, what do I do about x, and find the answer for almost any pest. So then as, as that learning process evolves for the grower, and he understands and learns uh, why we have this challenge and why we have that challenge and what we can do about them. And as farming management shifts on that educational pathway, the reality is that a shift to a regenerative agriculture doesn't really happen in the field. It happens in here and in here. And so as that shift happens, then the reality is as, if, when we are successful in, in growers and developing that close connection to their crops and to their environment have such a vibrant state of health, then at that point, I would say the tool becomes redundant. There no longer is a need for that because they're in tune with what's happening and what's going on. That's kind of my off-the-cuff answer without having thought about it. Yes? Have you taken into consideration climate change events and impacts and how that would affect this whole system? The answer is yes. Um, the short answer is yes. The long answer is a really long answer. <laughs> well, there are a few pieces. One is that a truly regenerative agriculture, first, is inherently much more climate resilient. Healthy plants. Uh, what we've observed is that the water consumption or the water requirements by really healthy plants drops by at least 50%, in some cases more. That's a huge water savings that I think has not yet been recognized. I haven't heard anyone else talk about that at all. And then, of course, when you have really healthy soils, the soil's resilience, the capacity to store and hold water, also increases tremendously. And the combination of those two effects and, and the changes that are happening within plant uh, biochemistry also greatly increase the plant's resistance to uh, high and low temperatures. 
So you can have environments that are a lot warmer without having the same degree of stress impact and environments that are a lot colder. How much colder? Uh, we've been able to lower the, the one data point that we have at this point that we've quantified is that we're able to reduce a plant's uh, freezing temperature by about 6 degrees Fahrenheit very consistently. So wherever a given variety or species might be, we can drop that about 6 degrees Fahrenheit uh, with nutrition. On the temperature increase side, uh, we don't yet have enough experience to know how much, but we know that we can significantly. Now, all those pieces that I mentioned are all outcomes. Those are all results of a regenerative agriculture system. Um, the question to think about or uh, that you raised is, what are the implications of a changing climate in making recommendations? Um, to a degree, I mean, the reality is that we will be directly measuring soil respiration, for example, soil microbial activity. We'll be directly measuring the release of carbon dioxide from the soil profile. We'll be di directly measuring uh, plants' respiration and photosynthetic activity. And so those are, on an agricultural farm scale, almost micro indicators of what's happening at the macro level with, within climate change. Um, yeah, those are my thoughts on the short answer. I don't know if that answers your question adequately. Yes, Julie. Why do plants only need half as much water? Uh, there's two major pieces. The first is that when plants absorb nutrition in the form of simple ions, particularly nitrate, um, in a conversation I think I saw Olivier, Olivier is here and will be speaking again this afternoon, speaking yesterday, uh, he pointed out how when plants absorb just nitrate instead of amino acid nitrogen, that by itself can increase their water requirement by 50%. In addition to that, um, when, do I have that correct, Olivier? The water use yes, water use efficiency. So the second aspect is the quantity of water required for respiration. So you have essentially, foundationally two metabolic processes going on within plants that consume water. One of them is photosynthesis. The second is respiration. Respiration occurs amongst other reasons, um, primarily largely for cooling. And when you have a healthy plant that has a glossy, waxy leaf surface, high lipid content, high fat content, it conducts heat much better and reflects heat much better. The bottom line is that it cools the plants much more efficiently and there's much less water required for plant cooling. So when you have high temperatures, when, you have, when you're growing plants in really hot conditions, um, for many of our food crops, that's uh, the C3 photosynthetic pathway plants, that's above 86 degrees Fahrenheit. When you go above 86 degrees Fahrenheit, the quantity of water required to cool a healthy plant versus an unhealthy plant is also significantly less. I don't know how much less, but I know it's a big number. We had a question over here. Yes. You said that, uh, so say I'm a greenhouse farmer in the northern hemisphere. You said that during the summer you have uh, uh, more organic uh, fields yes. uh, in your soils. So during winter time, um, you have actually uh, bad growing conditions. And how can you change that? Is that Yes, it is possible, uh, and it is possible simply by changing the soil's paramagnetism. So when you have very high paramagnetism in the soil profile, that fixes the problem. We had a question, yes. Oh my goodness. The rabbit hole just gets deeper and deeper. So the question, the, the, the question was um, thinking about solar radiation and um, that we are coming into a solar minimum, both a solar minimum on the short solar cycle and a grand solar minimum at the same time. Um, what are the implications for having cooler summers and cooler growing conditions? Yes. So what are the implications for the next few years and at what point do we shift back out of that cycle? So um, first of all, this is not my area of expertise. I have been learning a lot about this in the last couple of years uh, or trying to. It's my understanding that right now we are, so we have a what is it, a 10 or 11 year solar cycle? I think a 10, 11 year solar cycle, uh, peak to trough, and we are right now approaching the bottom of the trough. So the expectation is that the next two to three years, we are likely to have cooler summers. 
And so how do we manage that? Um, I think the implications for us is that we should expect that we'll probably have harder winters. We'll probably have a harder winter this winter for the next couple of years. And we should expect a tendency towards having uh, later frost in the spring and earlier frost in the fall um, by a week or two. I don't expect there to be any significant outliers more than what we've already been observing for the last 10 years. Um, then the longer solar cycle, the, the grand, what is referred to as the grand solar cycle, um, we are also approaching the bottom of the trough or starting to go on the downhill slope. We've been on the uphill slope of the grand solar cycle for the last 20 to 30 years. And now we're, we've crossed that threshold and we're starting to go back down. So I think there is a longer cycle of cooling as well. The reality is that um, we have to look at what is it that we can manage that can make a difference. And what we can manage that makes a difference is we can manage soil health and organic matter capacity to hold water, and we can measure plant health and resilience to temperature extremes. When we do those two things, by managing plant nutrition, by managing soil health, we have created a lot of resilience and a lot of buffer into the system. That's what we can manage, and that's what we need to do, particularly for the next few years. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think it does. I might buy a farm in New York, so I'm just worried about the extra cold. Move to Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Look at what happened in North Dakota and Montana this year. Yeah. Farmers had uh, crops buried in snow on a significant scale. So we'll probably see more of that happening in northern climates. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the question was, in a southern climate or in a, a farm in Virginia, should I begin planting crops that might do better in a more northern climate or in a more colder climate? Um, here's what you should expect. You should expect more extreme climate variability. There will be hotter, longer, there were longer, more intense periods of hot weather and longer, more intense periods of cold weather. We will see more extremes. So, um, and we will see both of those within the same season, sometimes within weeks of each other. That's the climate that we, that's the climate that exists now, and that's why developing climate resilience becomes so important. Yes? Well, that also then, to go back to my earlier question, Farmers really should not become automatons. They need to understand the principles, not just recommendations. You say you, you share that. Yes. If we had a long experience with what we call the system of rice intensification, where you get a very much better phenotype from any given genotype, or roots, or tillers, larger panicles, but also <coughs> resistance to lodging. Yep. Because the roots are good and the pillars are thicker. Uh, Resistance to growth stress. Yep. There was a study done in India where they were looking at the ratio of uh, uh, you know, mill uh, millimoles of carbohydrate fixed per microvolt of water conspired, and it was more than twice. Exactly. The had this response of wood roots for tillers. You know, wood leaves don't senesce uh, with 2.6 microvolts versus 1.6. So that's more than double the carbohydrate fixed per unit of water. Exactly. That's what I'm talking about. So could, all, could you guys hear that? Yeah. yeah. I wanted to reinforce your point. Of course, anyone who works with soil understands all water retention, water absorption, and retention depends upon aggregation, but also depends on the life of the soil. Yeah, absolutely. The life of the soil is kind of a reservoir for water. They have a certain turnover, but they bank it. They store it in the soil along with the pores and the micropores that absorb and hold water. So yep. we think, how do we manage the system to have that best rather than kind of sort of micromanage and change our, our, our recommendations as the temperature goes up two more degrees centigrade. Yep. And I think it's a, it, you know, growing heaven plant sounds tautological. Having yeah. healthy soil sounds tautological, but it's got a lot of good empirical evidence. Yes. So I know there's a few more questions out there. But we've been circling around this conversation around the importance of biology, which is foundational, fundamental. I talked about it quite a bit last year. Um, for those of you that were present then, I hosted one of my most fascinating podcast interviews yet a few days ago. It's being posted at the beginning of December. 
uh, was Dr. James White from Rutgers University. He's published a number of, of uh, white papers. Um, but I want to give you just, just the synopsis of his work. So he has been, he didn't originate the term, but he's been popularizing the, popularizing the term of rhizophagy. Rhizophagy simply means root feeding or root eating. And he has identified, for those of you who've listened to me on the podcast and webinars and, and live presentations, you know that I'm very passionate about the idea that plants can absorb microbial metabolites, that they are not dependent on absorbing simple ions from the soil solution, and that if we were to change plant nutrition, to the, when, when plants begin absorbing the majority of their nutrition as microbial metabolites, plant health, and the system's resilience, everything begins changing. Everything changes very quickly. Well, there's been actually a surprising amount of science around plant absorption of microbial metabolites over the course of the last 60 to 70 years, but it hasn't, certainly hasn't caught mainstream attention. And I'm really uh, hopeful that James' work does. But the foundational idea has been that you have a growing root tip and this growing root tip, the cells here at the end are, this tip is actually surprisingly porous. And you have bacteria and algae and fungi and all these organisms in the soil profile that are actually absorbed into the root. They penetrate into the root, they go inside the root, and they begin living completely inside the plant. They have a symbiotic relationship here, and this is referred to when plants live, or excuse me, when biology lives inside a plant, they're referred to as being endophytes. So you may have heard of endophyte-free fescue, for example, or endophyte-free plants. So uh, particularly, he's, he's observed and documented fungi and bacteria and algae to move into plants. Then, once they're inside the plant root, they begin moving back through the root system, and... In this pathway, the root system or the root cells release superoxide and they oxidize all the cell membranes. So the cell membranes are oxidized and now all of the organelles and, and all of the nutrients contained inside the cell are available for the plant to absorb. And plants actually absorb these macromolecules through a process known as endocytosis. So endocytosis has been known in animals uh, and in human cells for a long time, and it's been uh, postulated in, in plant cells since the 60s and 70s. But the idea of endocytosis is essentially that you have a cell which, and then when you have the exposure of a, a macromolecule on its side, which theoretically should be impossible to absorb, I say theoretically, discount that, is not possible for a cell to absorb based on the presently accepted science of cell physiology and cross-membrane transfer with um, pumps and so forth. What actually happens is that the cell adapts its membrane into a balloon form. This begins moving in this direction. And ultimately, it becomes completely, completely encapsulated. And this entire organelle, or this entire, it can be a chunk of RNA or DNA or uh, peptides or enzymes or whatever, these macromolecules are absorbed into the plant cells. So and on this pathway through the, growing, uh, through the root system, or through the root tip, or right behind, immediately behind the root tip, this process of endocytosis is happening. But not all the biology is killed in this process. Some of it survives the process of having its cell membrane stripped. And then when it's at some point, it moves out to the outer part of the root, and it triggers the formation of root hair. And they actually move out through root hair, and they circulate for a while here at the tip, and then they move out through the root hair tip into the soil profile. And then when they're in the soil profile, the plant root actually feeds them. It begins exuding, in that particular location, it begins exuding a lot of carbohydrates and other compounds, it actually provides all the nutrients that the bacteria or fungi or algae need
to reform their cell membranes because these are now essentially naked cells without a cell membrane. And it gives them everything they need to reform their cell membranes. And essentially farms, it, it's plants farm microbes the exact same way that we farm livestock. They are feeding the microbes here. And then this population obviously propagates through the soil along the root system, goes back down to the root. And now the plants or following root tips that are coming along behind this primary root tip access these nutrients from this biology. Rhizophagy. Yes. There's, it was a dynamite interview. I'm going to be posting a number of his peer-reviewed pi uh, papers, which are really, really good. But in, as if this, and by the way, this was an incredible interview. These were the last 15 minutes. The first 45 minutes were probably even better than this, or as good. And he said one thing that really gave me a lot to think about. So I've also said many times, based on conversations that I've had with Don Huber and other plant pathologists, that um, it is possible when we change. So when we have a soil that has really active microbial populations, and when there are the correct characteristics, the right biology are present, we can develop what is called a disease suppressive soil. And it's been my understanding in the past that when we have a disease suppressive soil, it will take uh, it will change the expression of all of these potential um, pathogens, such as verticillium and fusarium and so forth, to be saprophytes, decomposers of non-living plant residues. So they are still present, but they're having a beneficial impact as a saprophyte. But James said, that's not incorrect, but it's incomplete. When you have, <clears throat> let's say, you have a strand of fusarium out here. This is obviously, I'm a great artist. Um, when you have path potential, when you have organisms that are potential pathogens in the soil profile, these endophytes that have this close symbiotic relationship with the plant will actually colonize the fusarium or the verticillium or any potential pathogen. And when they colonize it, they weaken it. They extract some of the sugars out of it, some of the food sources that it has. But the really important piece is that they change its behavior. And it's no longer a pathogen. It actually changes, and it now develops into an endophyte, and it develops a symbiotic relationship with the plant instead of being a pathogen. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> so we had, uh, we had a, quite a fascinating conversation. There is one other piece that uh, I think is necessary pointing out. So the endophytes that he described, all of these organisms that have this endophytic relationship with the plant, symbiotic relationship with the plant, come from two places. There is significant overlap between um, the microbial population that should be present in a healthy soil and the microbial population on the seed coat. And I asked the question about what happens when we treat seeds with fungicides? What happens when we treat vegetable seeds with hot, hot water to remove bacteria? And he said that we definitely do damage the microbial population on the seed, which has a, really predisposes that plant to pathogenic invasion in the early stages of life. But, um, and then I, I specifically asked the question about corn, and he, he pointed out that many of our modern corn varieties, and I asked about corn, but I'm realizing now that the, this is true not just of corn, but actually for a number of different plants. He said that when plants are propagated at some point during the breeding processes, when they are propagated by cell culture, they lose all of their endophytes on the seed itself. So now when you begin, so what, is, what he's observed is that many of our modern corn varieties no longer carry their protective organisms on the seed. They are now very disease susceptible. So this is something that's true for corn, but I would say it would be logical to extrapolate that that is likely to be true for any seed or any plant which has been propagated by cell culture. Yes? So the question was, uh, do I know if the endophytes are entering the meristematic area uh, when the cells are differ still differentiating? I remember James talking about that in some of his papers, but I don't remember what he said. Well, what we do know 
from Dr. Maywan Ho's work, she described how we have significant transfer of genetic material between the soil biology and plants. And I suspect this is one pathway that we haven't been aware of in the past for significant transfer of genetic material. I mean, we know that uh, it's been well documented that when we have a genetically modified plant, we end up with genetically modified DNA in the soil microbial profile in a matter of a few days or weeks. Yeah. So that, that actually, um, that actually would, it, it would be, when we look at all of the various mechanisms and means for plant signaling, for plant signaling the soil microbial population, what nutritional requirements that it has, what nutrients that it wants the soil microbes to, be, to release, this is probably another signaling mechanism, another signaling pathway, in addition to all the biochemical signals that we have identified and defined so far. Yeah, I get pretty excited about this. <laughs> Rice, there's a bit of a puzzle, which this helps to explain. Uh, they did experiments, Rusty Rodriguez and colleagues out of Washington, where they coated rice seeds with... Can you speak up just a little bit? Uh, they, they, they coated rice seeds with Fusarium clamorum, Fusarium being this normal pathogen. They found that coated seeds with Fusarium versus uncoated seeds germinated faster, put out root hairs faster, and had about five times more root growth within the first eight days. Now, wow. What's going on, we don't know. There's some beautiful slides to, to show that, which is an article published. But the thing is that Fusarium, which is, we think, a, a bad guy, yep. as, a, as an inoculant with rice, has a very beneficial effect on its germination and early root growth. You know what James' work, and not just James' work, but other researchers also, similar to what you've described, uh, what they tell me about soil biology, there are no bad guys. We created the bad guys by our mismanagement of the ecosystem. That's it. Or by the system, ecosystem being mismanaged in some manner, yes. So I'm, I'm trying to, I want to make sure I understand your question correctly. Are you asking how do we transfer this information? How can you transfer this information to other growers? Or how can you transfer this information to consumers? Yes, uh, an important question and one that I don't have an easy answer for. So to the point that consumers can become growers, and I believe they should. I believe everybody should have a closer connection with their food. Um, I believe we need to bring back the victory gardens, actually. Um, we would have victory over a lot of diseases and degenerative illnesses and uh, mental challenges and more, wouldn't we, if that were to happen? I'm reminded of a quote that Arden Anderson repeated over and over again. He said, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And I, my personal experience has been that I have found it to be generally unproductive to try to persuade someone who has no desire to learn. And the good news is that today there are so many people who do desire to learn that there is a, a, a tremendous uh, desire for knowledge and information, which is why um, I've tried to share as much online as I have. And I really believe that it is very valuable for any of us, to, for all of us, to become teachers. Because when we become teachers is when we really begin to learn the most rapidly. Um, so. Those are my comments in response to your question. Didn't really answer your question. Yes. <laughs> Can you speak up just a little bit? I'll try. Um, I started out um, learning about farming in grammar school by getting up early and watching the modern farmer black and white television before I went to school. Um, and evolved that to be a conventional farmer and a conventional nurseryman uh, to the point where I'm not sure why I'm still alive with all the chemicals that I used in the past and cancer free. Um, but evolved into uh, organic farming and organic gardening just because of the damage to my crops that the conventional uh, problems I was using or the exacerbation of the issues by using those conventional chemicals. This goes back a while. I looked in my file recently, and I saw one article that had Elaine Ingram sitting as a graduate student uh, in one of the pictures. Um, but I'm also 
also a student of the way people uh, learn and evolve and the way society takes new information and makes change. And I don't think we have any automaton farmers. <laughs> no. Just because they're here. Um, and I think uh, I remember in anthropology learning that uh, people uh, adhere to the, the uh, best available technology. And I go to local conferences, I go to this conference, I go to conventional farmer conferences. And this is becoming the best available technology. Because yes. The other stuff is not working anymore. Yes. And now we have conventional farmers coming to find out what they can do better. And then you have the trickle down, the extension service says, well, we better start teaching about soil biology because they need to know this. And then someone else starts doing research <laughs> I, I'll, I'll get, go ahead. But well, let's hope that the extension to that is that we develop an emotional relationship with each other. And yes. as a social scientist, I'm most concerned about everyone having food, food being available to everyone. And that means structuring societal the societies in such ways that everybody has access to food and that people are not left out from the table. The biggest challenge, I think, is not only people having an emotional relationship to the earth, but developing a real heart as well as mind emotional relationship to each other. Yeah. I, to speak to that a bit, um, well, there's a few comments that come to mind. But actually, I see, I come from a very different background growing up in an Amish community. and. Um, Working primarily outside the Amish community, I've come to appreciate many of the values that that community holds, particularly the value, the, the strong uh, family and community and social structure. And I think one of the significant strengths is that uh, young children growing up have a sense of place, of who they are in a social fabric. Um, but I also want to speak to your comment about the best available technology. Yes, go ahead. Another thing, I have a degree in environmental education, which is experiential education. And the, the way it trickles down to farming is you learn from experience, you learn from doing. And the brain is hardwired. When you learn something by experiencing it, you cannot forget it. And you also have the innate ability to communicate it to somebody else. And it's a safety mechanism that could be human evolution. So Eric, to answer that woman's question over there, everyone here is going to be a teacher of everything that they learn experientially. We, we can't help it. Yes. And I don't know a farmer that doesn't have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good comment. Thank you. Um, at speaking to regenerative agriculture and, and this uh, this different cognition about agriculture ecosystems becoming the best available technology. There has been a significant shift in our work at AEA with the new people who contact us for the first time. Up until four or five years ago, generally, and I'm speaking specifically now about large-scale mainstream growers who have hundreds or often thousands of acres of fruit and vegetable crops, often the conversation would be something like, uh, historically, the conversation would be something along the lines of, uh, I've heard about the work you're doing. It seems really interesting, and I'd like to try it on a few of my acres. I'd like to try it out and just see what's happening and what's going on. Today, we have people calling us, and they say, uh, I've listened to all of your podcasts. I've listened to all of your webinars, and I want to do it on 800 acres. That has happened a number of times the last few years. Yes. I'm 
unfortunately, there wasn't a benchmark, so the consultant did the best job he could in recommending foliars for the plant. Uh, what's interesting is, uh, if you're familiar with the nutritive cycle theory in Korean natural farming, mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot that I've been able to study on that. There's really nothing on that. In fact, Korean natural farming is like, uh, it's just a bunch of formulas and it's nutritive cycle theory, IMOs, and off you go. Uh, but what's interesting is, uh, early on, the recommendation uh, was like, I need to put calcium on my plants. And uh, my plants were deficient in calcium. So actually, this is uh, actually a contradiction for Korean with this nutritive uh, cycle theory. We would be more putting on nitrogen. And actually, later in the process, testing later, uh, AEA was recommending nitrogen. And whereas the nutritive cycle theory would have been saying, well, no, at that point, you should be putting on calcium. So I'm wondering if you know about the cycle theory. Uh, there's really not much out there. And, and do you think about that in terms of um, as you can tell, I love learning, and I read a lot. Uh, I'm not intimately familiar with Korean natural farming. I have heard a bit about it. The question that I would love to ask you is, did you try both of them? Actually, um, putting on your calcium had no impact. Great. So we learned something. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Later we switched to another certifier and we were we finally got approval to use them again. So later in the season I started using Korean natural farming formulas in addition to yours. In one instance, uh, when I did, I was still using your calcium, but I also added almost a homeopathic dose of the Korean natural farming eggshell. Awesome, we learned something again. No, I, I think I can just say simply that um, our products and our approach to plant nutrition continue to evolve every year, and they're completely different now from what they were 10 years ago because we continue to learn things just in the, in the example that you, that you described. And from my perspective, there is just... The ultimate report card, the ultimate report card is plant health. When you have a healthy plant that is nutritious, has higher nutritional levels, that is resistant to diseases and insects, then something is working. And if you don't, whatever you're doing is not working. And I am open to any and all pathways that get us to that point. That's, to me, that's the bottom line. Um, nutritional products, microbial products, compost teas, etc. Those are all a tool to get to that pathway. Yes, we do. We think very much about plant reproductive cycles, vegetative cycles, etc. That's everything is based on that, really. Yes. Yeah, John. It seems to me as though you've got just a little bit of information rattling around in your ears. Um, <laughs> and like, I want to take a moment and recognize this monumental task that you and everybody here. Basically, trying to decode like four million years of life on Earth. <laughs> we will never be successful, right. at least not. <laughs> and so, I, I want, I'm curious what you think. Like, trying try to do that, decode that information um, so as to work with it to produce food that is, is gen, genuinely nutritive. Like, I mean, that can't be done by people on a diet of Doritos and Big Macs. It cannot. So I'm curious, like, to what extent your own diet of food based on soil that's regenerated has allowed you to synthesize this information and organize this information. Actually, I think that's I think that's an important question to ask. Um, so. We can read the first reference to food's implications for uh, 
um, spiritual knowledge coming from Rudolf Steiner. Rudolf Steiner in the period when he was teaching described how food produced at that time did not have enough, um, I'm looking for the right word, didn't have enough spiritual grounding, didn't have enough spiritual sustenance to allow people to develop their spiritual connection with plants. And I, I dislike the word spiritual because it today carries too many other connotations, but to develop that heart cognition with plants. So he pointed that out decades ago. And um, speaking from personal experience, um, yes, I am very stringent about the quality of the food that I eat. And I actually notice my, my mental acuity and mental clarity is the first thing that goes when my diet starts dropping off. And where I have the most significant challenge is when I travel to work with farmers in the Midwest. The Midwest is a good food desert. And um, so to, first of all, when, when I am at home and when I have good control over, over the food that I eat, I definitely try to make good, sure that I have a very good diet, high levels of healthy fats. And um, in spite of all that, I'm not able to grow all of my own food, uh, although I do, and my family and I do a significant amount. And um, I supplement intensely. I supplement all the time because I don't have confidence in the food supply to be able to give my body everything that it requires for optimal performance. I, similar to a plant, I don't care about average performance. Uh, I've experienced average performance in my life, and I don't want to be back there again. <laughs> yes? Um, so I have a question about, have you thought about how um, regenerative practices either work with or don't or can um, change soils that have toxicity? Oh, yes. Yeah. like heavy metals? Well, also, I mean, there's other kinds of contaminants for sure, but, you know, I thought of this when you were thinking of victory gardens or speaking of victory gardens, how many, because I'm from an urban environment, there are so many people growing um, community garden kind of scales. And, mm -hmm. You know, they're small, but all together, they make a yeah. lot of, if you put them all together collectively, they become a large po possibility or potential for growing and maybe even doing these practices, but they also inherit a bit yeah. So. Yes, so the brief answer, uh, just kind of as a general broad umbrella, is that it is possible to either sequester or I'll just use the word detoxify. It is possible to detoxify every toxic element that we know of from an elemental perspective, speaking about cadmium and arsenic and lead, et cetera, et cetera. It's possible to remove all of those from the soil profile or sequester them in a form that they are not absorbed by the plants that we're growing. Um, there's a lot of research uh, in the literature about how this can happen with humic substances and also how specific plants, and this, this is where when, when you start, when you, are, you have a specific situation with specific known toxins, then you can begin identifying plants that are known to sequester those toxins and either remove them from the soil or uh, transmute them to a form that they no longer show up. Uh, and by the way, hemp is one of the plants that does a lot of different things extraordinarily well when it comes to removing toxins from the soil profile. Uh, it actually absorbs them into the plant uh, in, in, in many cases. So it's really interesting. Cannabis producers are <laughs> discovering significant challenges because when the, the cannabis plant and hemp in general is so extraordinarily good at picking up toxins that when you have cadmium or arsenic in the soil profile in part per billion or part per trillion concentrations, they will pick it up and accumulate it in a high concentration within the plant itself. Um, you compost it and put it somewhere else. <laughs> or actually, maybe you create biochar out of it. I mean, I don't know the answers to those questions, but at least we're able to remove it from a broad area and perhaps concentrate it more. So the answers are out there. And can you just, I mean, we're going to be doing a project with you, Nova Mass, in a couple urban settings in Massachusetts next year um, on this particular issue. So hopefully we can. We'll be able to validate all of this. Yeah. Uh, and the other, the other aspect, of course, in addition to the elemental toxins, are the hydrocarbons. And again, 
uh, more, there's actually quite a bit of research in, in both laboratory and field validation that we're in the process of right now. But I think a year ago I spoke about a new product that we're developing. Uh, we released it in Pennsylvania and used it in Pennsylvania this last growing season. It's, if all goes well with the regulatory process, it'll be released for use by next spring across the entire country. And um, laboratory evidence suggests that we can eliminate all toxins, all herbicides, all hydrocarbons from the soil profile in when the biology is sustained and has enough carbohydrates, enough of a food source, it can happen in a matter of weeks. And that is pretty exhilarating. Does that include plastics? Um, does not include plastics, as in still solid plastic form, unfortunately. Uh, you know, one of my uh, mentors, Bruce Tinio, actually developed a microbe in the lab, or I shouldn't say developed, he found it in the wild and cultured it in the lab that consumed PVC. And he had a flask in his lab that was consuming four pounds of PVC per 24-hour period. And um, he eventually dumped it and tossed it back into the environment because he couldn't find an off switch. He couldn't find a way to get them to slow down. And can you imagine well, first of all, there, there's, there's a part of me that would love to release something like that into the oceans. Yeah. And then I also imagine what would be possible if somebody dumped some of that down their drain in a city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But I think knowing that history, knowing that Bruce was once able to isolate an organism that was successful in doing that, gives me hope and confidence that that will happen again in the future and somebody will able to be able to replicate that in the future. When the crisis becomes big enough, we will figure out the solution. And we are, I mean, there is now very good evidence that, for instance, mangrove ecologies are utilizing the carbon and polyethylene. So, you know, at the turn of the century, in 2000, we read a plastic engineering handbook, and it was asserted that polyethylene would be resistant to any microbial utilization for 250 to 500 years. Where they came up with those numbers, I don't know, but I guess they not make that old formulation. But, but it, it, there is an accelerated microbial yep. utilization of those carbons, for better or worse, in terms of soil. I mean, I'm, I'm personally convinced after 50 years of whining about soil inclusion of plastics that it's going to very much become an issue of loading. Response. Still appropriate to resist. Absolutely. Yeah, and I know there's also been research about um, uh, wax moths being able to consume plastic films very rapidly. So I think that is encouraging. Again, and that is because of the microbes that are contained within their digestive system actually being capable of breaking down many different plastics. Um, so I'm I'm. I'm very concerned about the, particularly all the microplastics that we have in the environment today. Uh, I think there is cause for grave concern there, but uh, I'm, I'm not without hope that we'll find a solution for it. So we've got time for one more question. Yes. You got it. <laughs> um, I came in late, so I'm unaware of that. I don't know whether you surveyed the crowd, and I can certainly ask the registration, but I go to events, and I, I went to a National Invasive Species Conference uh, last month. I always ask the, the audience, who's here, who, who depends on agriculture to make a living, or who's here on their own dime, who's here from the world of recreation. So hearing us talk today about education and rehabilitation and, and landscapes, I get contacted very often by land trusts. They manage a lot of land in the name of conservation. I agree with that or not. But they, I, I, I'm curious to know if there is anyone in the room right now from a land trust. And then, and then I will always ask them, well, how come they don't go to these conferences? Because I never see them at it. They're, they're in their own stove pipe. And that's an accusation, I realize. So I, that's what I want to ask you. Do you know you surveyed this audience this morning? I have not. Is anyone here from a land trust? No. One. Can consult with. Okay, I'll take. In, because of that question, I'll take time for one more. Yes, we'll go to you. Uh, <clears throat> from broad acre farming uh, globally, trying to scale this, execute the models that we're talking about. You and I kind of travel the same path. What's your opinion 
hate to burst everybody's bubble here, genetic blockers that make a big ag or a seed genetics company is putting in plants to genetically block certain biologies so that that plant still has a strain of disease. In it. Um, so, to the point that we made about uh, corn breeding through cell culture, uh, not having the endophytes, it's obvious that modern, many modern breeding techniques or some modern be breeding techniques have stripped the seeds of their associated disease resistance organisms and endophytes. Um, but the reality is that, as I see it, the large agrochemical corporations that are perceived of being in control of the food supply actually have extremely shaky foundations. I don't expect them to survive on their present business model into the future for the long term because of the point that was made earlier is that they are no longer the best, techno best available technology. And they are they're, they're no longer the best available technology for the large-scale broadacre growers in one specific way that is extremely important, and that is farm profitability. We know that farm profitability has been on the decline. In fact, uh, broadacre crop farmers in the Midwest have consumed equity on their operations for four years out of the last five, except for those farmers who are planting non-GMO seeds, those farmers who are growing cover crops, those farmers who are adopting these various practices and going down this pathway, those growers have higher profitability. They don't particularly necessarily have higher yields, but they consistently have higher profitability. At the very least, those farmers are going to be the farmers that survive financially and economically. So the existing status quo is not, doesn't seem probable to me to remain as a status quo for another let's say 10 to 15 year time period, n not much past that point because it can't sustain itself. And it also depends on, has depended historically on an abundance of rich topsoil, which it has eroded and degraded and caused to disappear. When that disappears, uh, my own personal story and the story the gentleman here shared earlier is that, and it's a story of many farmers, is that uh, many farmers that make the switch is that they use conventional mainstream practices until they didn't work anymore. Why do we get calls today, not just from uh, fruit and vegetable growers or broad acre growers who say, I've listened to all the information, I've, I've tried to learn as much as I can, I want to do my entire operation. That is happening because they recognize that what they're doing right now and have been doing historically is no longer working. That is reaching critical threshold. So I'm actually very optimistic that I, I've set the goal for myself if I want regenerative agriculture to be the global mainstream by 2040. To me, that's a very realistic and a very achievable goal, and we're well on the pathway to achieving that. So, thank you.